Okay, hi everyone. Today we are doing an episode of Ask the Experts and today we're having David Gestizia. I hope I didn't totally mess up your last name there. <laughs> no, that's perfect. Awesome. Thanks so much for coming on. So this show is basically, today's topic is uh, creative financing, which is always, uh, I find a great topic to talk about because we don't really get to a lot of people always have lots of questions about it um, because, I mean, being creative, sometimes you need that help to get you started. And then once you start hearing different solutions and things like that, you know, people then start realizing all the different opportunities that are out there. So today's topic is creative solution, uh, sorry, creative financing. And um, anyone, so anyone in the audience can ask questions. You can put up your hand or you can just interrupt us, no issues. We also have Facebook on. So anyone in my Facebook group, if you guys have questions, um, I'll be monitoring the comments. So feel free to also ask questions and I'll just make sure that I get those questions to David. So to get started, David, just let everyone know a little bit about you. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks so much, Diana. So um Thanks so much for joining everyone. My name is David. I run two mortgage teams with my partner, Sue. Um, we have Vision Mortgage Group, which is our residential mortgage team. And we have Vision Capital Partners, which is our commercial mortgage team. Um, between the two of us, we have you know, almost 40 years in financing. Uh, my background is in wealth management. Um, so before being in lending, spent some time in the wealth space, both at the banks and as well as with boutique firms. And uh, I, I really realized at some point along the way that I could help my clients grow wealth better through leverage than through selling traditional financial instruments. So um, we've moved forward with a focus in our current team really around helping investors create a vision and grow and scale their portfolio and be able to provide lending solutions that allow them to facilitate that. And I think that's probably you know one of the most common limitations for most investors is as long as I tell them they can keep qualifying for financing, they tend to keep wanting to buy. So I'm um, happy to answer any questions anybody has today. Um, you know, anything residential is totally fine. Anything commercial or, or multifamily residential is totally fine as well. Um, so feel free to ask away. Awesome. Awesome. So I'll get the ball rolling for everyone. And uh, let's just start with something super simple. What's... Uh, what strategies have you seen, um, like real estate strategies you've seen that you can use creative financing? And are there even any that there's for sure you can't use creative financing? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think it probably helps to answer that by maybe starting to, to kind of talk a little bit about creative financing and, and what we mean by that. I mean, it's not formally a technical term, I think. You know, when I, I think about the topic of creative financing, it's really being able to bring strategies and solutions to the table that are not your kind of everyday apparent strategies. Um, you have a lot of people in this industry that can do mortgages. You have your banks, you have your brokers. And, you know, I think people have a pretty good feel for kind of the basics um, with a lot of people who work in the finance area. You know, I think what I wanted to help focus on today is really those strategies that allow people to continue growing their portfolio and being able to move forward. I, I think probably the two most basic ones that I, I would want to address, um, I, I guess, firstly, is a, a, the Burr strategy. And, and I, I say that in the most broad context, because I know it's a very, very popular strategy. Uh, a lot of people wouldn't necessarily consider it creative, but I think it really goes a little bit deeper into understanding there's a whole bunch of different ways to execute that, you know, traditional burr. Um, and the first aspect of that is really focused on understanding your capital recycling capabilities when you do the acquisition. So I think the biggest challenge for most people when it comes to that is they, they're trying to get into this loop of infinite capital, right? I have a fixed amount of capital I can allocate to a project. I wanna be able to do that project and get all my money back and then do another project and get all my money back so that they can keep rolling forward. The biggest mistake people make is starting with the focus on understanding how you're gonna acquire that property. When we work with our investors, the starting focus acquisition is, is easy. The starting focus is always on 
what does the takeout look like? Let's analyze how much of your capital we're going to be able to achieve back at the end of this project and make sure before we even start that you understand how much money is being left on the table, right? So if you're an investor that wants a full burr, the easiest way to make sure that you always come to fruition on that is making sure that you're buying properties and executing on projects that you can predetermine that the opportunity for a full burr is there. Um, so I think that's, you know, that's one of the initial pieces that we use. The other piece would be like higher loan to value private financing and looking at some of these special private lenders that allow very, very small equity positions and understanding that there's lenders out there that will allow, you know, very small down payments. They'll allow those down payments to come from other debt, they'll allow them from unsecured credit facilities. Um, there's lenders both in the residential and the commercial space that will actually facilitate construction financing as well as the acquisition financing, which allows you to do a much bigger project with a smaller pool of capital. Um, and I think those would be kind of the two biggest strategies that I think we spend a lot of time with that, you know, many of the other people that we see in this industry aren't getting the, the full benefit of. Awesome. So have you, so these are the ones and, but you're also specifically talking about the multi-unit area for burrs oh, or are oh. you even, okay. Yeah. I mean, the same premise applies different lenders, different rates, different underwriting requirements, but the idea about going into a project with the mindset of being able to understand before you buy, is it actually possible to get all your capital back? Right. Um, you know, some deals, the projections may show you're going to get your capital back, but then, you know, you have $50,000 of renovation overruns. Well, that's an unforeseen that happens, right? But there's other deals that people take to me and it's like, there will be $500,000 of capital left in this deal, like for sure. In a best case scenario, there's 500,000 of capital left in this deal. So if your focus was a full burr because you need to recycle all that capital, I can tell you before you start, what is the absolute maximum potential in terms of the exit? And I think far too many people at that stage of acquisition are so laser focused on the acquisition piece and understanding how they're going to get their acquisition financing, that they're not taking the proper approach of really starting with the end in mind and then working their way backward to figure out what makes sense. Go ahead, Gary. I feel like you have a question, right? Yeah. <clears throat> so... First of all, uh, I'm pretty new to this uh, and I'm just trying to learn as much as I can. And my question is, so whenever uh, you're, um, you know, buying some property and before uh, you're planning to, to do a burr, so does it necessarily have to be like, you know, first when you buy a property, uh, so the lender, how does usually people, how does it usually work? Do people uh, buy properties and take loans from uh, uh, private lenders or B lenders first? And then once they refinance it and raise the value of the property, then, then get it refinanced from the A lenders? How does it usually work? It, it all depends on the investor. I mean, lots, well, most of my investors start with A lending and stay with A lending all the way through. Um, it, it really just depends on the individual and, and you know, their ability to qualify. But I think, you know, I've seen people be outrageously successful in real estate investing that are paying, you know, 15% interest rates. And ultimately, the reality is, as long as you can understand at what point that deal stops making sense, um, you can then start to filter into, well, what is your capacity to lend? What types of interest rates will you be looking at for certain types of projects? And then you're looking at those end values, you're looking at the ability to qualify at the end, and you can kind of work your, yourself backwards and say, well, unless I can acquire this property at a 3% interest rate, or unless I can refinance this property at 3% interest rate, the deal doesn't work, right? And if you're somebody that maybe has to start with private at eight or 10%, you can immediately look at that deal and say, this is not gonna meet my objective right? I'm not going to be able to get enough out of this to make sense for the project. And I think that's, you know, where I find a lot of newer investors and to be quite honest, even more senior investors um, making mistakes. And even people who've been in the game a long time, like we've been so um, 
accustomed to this appreciation thing, right? We've really gotten reliant on this idea that like anything you hold is going to appreciate somewhere between 10 to 30 percent, you know, every single year. So you're always leaving yourself open for that burr opportunity, even if you've done nothing. And every model we run assumes zero appreciation, right? So when I'm analyzing projects, it's like, let's look at this in today's market. And can you actually generate enough forced appreciation to achieve your full burr based on the value you're bringing to the project, not being reliant on the market creating that value for you? Because I think that's where, you know, it, we're really going to get a separation from the investors that know what they're doing and, and those that start sinking as we start to potentially see a stagnation in the, in the real estate prices based on where interest rates are going. Okay. And how does somebody determine that, uh, let's say uh, I, I buy this property and I know like, you know, um, af after doing some renovations, I, you know, try to find some comps with the, uh, with the updated, uh, like, you know, with the updated uh, condition of the house that this is going to be my after repair uh, value, right? And yep. then how, how do I determine um, that, you know, uh, that I'm not going over my budget in terms of uh, renovation costs so that I know that, you know, if I spend um, this much amount of money on renovations and I do specific this, 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 this stuff to improve the appraised value of the property, because I'm, an, I'm a new guy, right? I don't know, how would I actually be able to determine that, you know, this is the type of renovation that I want to be doing on this property and I, and, I have to stay within this uh, limit. Yeah, and I think that really comes down to your power team, right? That's that's you know kind of the discussion that happens with your realtor and your tradespeople to understand the cost value approach on some of that stuff, and and understanding from your agent, you know, what doing a, a specific set of things to the property is going to how that's going to impact the value. Um, and then understanding that your contractor is going to be able to, you know, quote those projects and then execute them on time and on budget. And, you know, all else being equal, if, if you have two people on that side of the equation that know what they're doing, you should have very predictable outcomes. Thank you. Yeah, I completely agree with that. <clears throat> and also just even... Um... Because I, something that I realized, and like you said, like the realtor can really help a lot is because different areas, things will actually, for example, I'll give you like in Toronto, we did underpinning, which is basically making the basement ceilings higher, um, like digging down. And for example, in Toronto, that created a lot of value in the area that we were renovating and where we went to Hamilton, we had low ceilings there. And that realtor was like, don't even waste your money. It's not worth it to even finish the basement over there. So I just wanted to reiterate, like, that's yeah. very true. Like, you do have to use your team because um, they, like, and you specifically want to make sure, especially for realtors, you're using the ones that work in those areas and really know it well to give you that good advice that you need. Um, so... I'll ask, I'll ask a question, but in case anyone else has a question, again, feel free to raise your hands or put it in the comments in the Facebook group, um, or you can even just unmute yourselves. But a comment that you were making about um, that you can just even, for example, use an A lender. Um, so things I've, I've heard, again, I usually do I do like really big kind of renovation ones. So I have to go with private because they don't get funded by A or B lenders. <laughs> but I have heard that a lot of people will go private is because um, if they stick with an, if they start with an A lender, they may not get fully to like the 75% loan to value and they may kind of cut them off at a certain rate. Have you heard that? Or is that certain lenders? Or I'm just curious. It, you it, it really has nothing to do with the lender. I mean, ultimately, the, the is it poor lenders, planning on the other side, like your TDS ratios are. Yeah, it, 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 to be quite honest, it's like the A lenders are. I think a lot of people, a lot of people see the lenders differently, right? Than they really are, and I, I don't know why some of the perceptions come come up, but in certain aspects of lending, A lenders are actually more lenient than B in private. Um, and one of the easiest ways to explain that is, you know, 
for the most part, assuming you qualify, assuming your debt servicing ratios are in line, A lenders are happy to do 80% of the appraised value, right? Generally speaking. And I think be it at the acquisition or be it at the takeout. So, you know, if you qualify for the A lenders on acquisition, you can do that. If you qualify for the takeout with the A lenders, you can do that too. The A lenders also can facilitate acquisition plus improvement budgets where they actually roll part of that into the mortgage. Or you can even do A lenders for acquisition and then put a construction second in behind them, which brings your blended cost of funds way down because you're funding 80% of the purchase with an A lender rate. And then you're only funding your construction budget at private lending rates. Um, but the lenders, like A lenders are typically the most generous on loan to value across the board, even more so than being private, as long as you can service the debt. Yeah, great. that's good to know because I've always heard people say they start with private and then go into A, a lenders or they just have an A lender and then find out. And so I, yeah, and another yeah. point that I think that is really great that you do that I just wanted to reiterate is that like the planning part, because I do notice, especially with a lot of newer investors or newer, let's say to certain strategies is they don't actually, like you said, they don't actually like check if, for example, they're cash flowing once the refi happens, if the if they can actually if their TDS ratios are actually good enough to um, to refi at the amount that you're expecting. And I do yeah. hear a lot of people always like, oh my God, my money got stuck in the deal. I only got actually like a little bit and I didn't get fully 75 or 80% loan to value. Yeah. So I think it's great that you do that because I guess some people help, need help with the planning and uh, and to even know, right? Because if, you, if, if you're not cash flowing, that can even be a deal breaker for someone to even, you know, let's say close on that deal. And it's better to know in advance than, then find out during because I've had some people also tell me that they had to sell because they found out that it just wasn't going to work out at all for them. Absolutely. And I think, you know, it's also really important to understand different A lenders have different policies, right? So, you know, one bank may go to 80% on a particular deal where a different colored bank is only going to go to 60%. And that's because they use incomes differently. They have different programs and specialty products and net worth programs and rental offset calculations and, and, you know, large portfolio calculations. Like there's just so much that goes into each of the lenders. You know, if you're dealing with one bank or one lender, just because they say that they can't do something doesn't mean there isn't a different A lender that would happily do the deal. Um, because the, the, strongest amount of variation to be quite honest in, in the lending space in a certain way is actually in the a lenders and you wouldn't really expect it right like i think a lot of people know that private lenders kind of have different buckets depending on the private same with the b lenders but in the a space people kind of think well the big five banks all basically do the same thing and they don't every single one has like very unique aspects of either how they structure the product or how they approve their lending that gives them a difference to the other four that can be applied in certain scenarios. If somebody um, doesn't have any question, I have one more question. Go ahead, no problem. So Dave, uh, I was gonna ask you, uh, when's the good time to set up a corp uh, corporation? When When's a good time to set up a corporation? Because I have uh, seen most of the experienced investors, they have their corporation set up, but I've heard from people that when you're first starting and it's you do not necessarily have to have a corporation set up so what's the criteria for that when's the good time to set up a corporation so if you're not self-employed 10 to 15 properties okay but i, I am self-employed at this point maybe if you're self-employed i'll say case by case sometimes it's the same sometimes it's different um, self-employed people have a different set of benefits revolving around a corporation than conventionally employed borrowers have. Um, there's no kind of blanket answer to that, but very much you know situational dependent. I would say for, for your typical retail investor that's employed, it's probably around that 10 property number. Um, for self-employed people, 
varies very wildly. It depends if you're self-employed as a sole proprietor or a corporation. It depends on how much excess retained earnings you generate through that corporation. And there's a whole bunch of other things that get into it. Um, generally, you know, the other caveat there is it makes lending worse. It makes tax worse, um, but it does help with liability. And I think that's one of the, the things that um, does get missed is that even though you might pay a higher tax rate or, or your lending might be more expensive or more restrictive, one of the benefits of a corporation, it does give you more liability protection. Um, so again, depending on the size of the portfolio each investor strives to create, there will be kind of a, a different play there um, for everybody. It's not really a one size fits all type of deal. Yeah, and probably having your accountant uh, accountant and lawyer, I feel like that's kind of a question that involves a lot of different people because even uh, just helping to plan, it's almost like helping to plan your life out of the same, like your work life, like your bit, like what your expectations are. And, you know, that's like a very big question <laughs> that yeah, involves and, a lot of people. <laughs> and making sure that your accountant is well versed in real estate investing, right? Like, like lenders, like lawyers, like you need to go to the right person for the right thing. Um, so it is important that, you know, you're having that discussion with somebody who understands the nuances of, of taxation around real estate investing, and it's something they do regularly. Did you have another question or you're okay? Yeah. So I was going to ask you, so let's say I have bought first uh, two properties that are single family homes, right? And then, um, Further, uh, in my third property, let's say I come across in triplex and I want to buy the triplex. So what percentage of uh, what percentage of the rent that, that I'll be collecting from the triplex will be counted towards uh, my in, towards uh, my every, mortgage? Every, every single lender does that differently. Okay. And, and this is, and again, back to, back to my previous comment, right, is the banks don't underwrite these the same. Like, all big five banks have a different way of looking at that number. And I think that's really important. And, and same with the B lenders, they all have a different way of looking at that. So it's really important to understand that like there isn't a one size fits all solution for that. It is very much understanding, moving through the motions and understanding the different lenders and the different lending options that you have. You know, the one thing I'll say this, this wasn't really asked, but I'll mention it as a blanket statement because I've been talking about it a lot lately is like single family homes in Ontario, generally speaking, make terrible investment properties. Mm -hmm. um, and I see a lot of people sitting on single family portfolios saying, Dave, can I refi, Dave, can I refi? And it's like, let's put aside the qualifying. Let's pretend I could refinance you. Your cash flow would be so destroyed yeah. that it, it completely unbalances your entire portfolio. And, you know, it's really important to understand in a rising rate environment, in an environment where we may see the natural market appreciation stagnate, that if you don't continue to have cash flow, your ability to grow as an investor is going to stop. Because when you hit that critical mass, when you're into commercial lending, when you're into large blanket portfolio lending, multifamily lending with CMHC, um, any commercial banking lending, all of that lending requires meeting cash flow debt servicing. They don't care if you make a million dollars a year at your job. They don't lend on employment income. They're lending on your portfolio making sense. And I think it's really important to understand that if you want to grow and you want to scale, continuing to have a portfolio that, that continues to cash flow and make sense the whole way through is a really important aspect of of getting to that level of growth. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so we have a question from Facebook group and they're asking, what is the most creative um, financing deal that you've seen? It's a really good question. We've seen a lot. Um, from an investor lens, uh, I can think of a couple. I mean, we've seen some like 120, 130% loan-to-value stuff. It's not that creative. It's just really outrageous terms. It's like buy this plus here's all the renovation money. Um, probably the most creative product in the space is something called a CMHC Purchase Plus Improvement Program. 
um, this is a commercial product and it's used in a very, very niche situation um, that requires vacant multi-res buildings. But when I can use it, I can get 90% advances on acquisition plus all of construction costs, plus all of soft costs, plus all of carry costs funded at sub 3% rates. Um, the project has to make sense. The takeout has to make sense. There's a whole bunch of things that have to align to make this very, very particular product work. But in the situations that we've been able to make it work, like there was one project that we got 98.7% overall project LTV, um, which was insane. It was, it was obviously phenomenal. It was a, it was a big 30-something um, unit building in Hamilton, but um, that was being converted. But I think like- And that was A lender, B lenders? Commercial. Commercial. CMHC. Yeah, yeah, CMHC lending. Oh, CMHC. Um, it's a really, yeah. So, I mean, on, on the commercial side, I think that product sets itself apart simply because it's so niche that we actually have to sometimes battle with the CMHC underwriters over their interpretation of the program because it's so infrequently used. But if you really understand how it works, it's incredibly powerful. Um, you know, in the A space, I think some of the blanket lending we've done has been pretty cool. We've done like portfolio washes where somebody's like tapped out because they have too many properties, the A lenders won't lend, not because they don't qualify anymore, they just have too many doors or too many properties. And we had like a commercial lender come in, do a blanket takeout of their entire A lending portfolio, refinance the whole portfolio back up to 75% loan to value, but inside a corporation and under commercial lending. Um, and it was, allowed them then because the banks don't consider commercial lending in the context of residential lending. So then what happened is when this investor went for their next property, it was like just having an owner occupied residence again and they were back to square one, right? So it was really cool to kind of completely wash the portfolio. Um, and then, sorry, the CMHC program is called the Purchase Plus program. Um, you know, and, and then, you know, we've done like deferred registration lending. So like an A lender is placing a mortgage and we need like a top up lender, but they can't register on the same day because the first lender can't know about the second lender. So I got the lender to release funds prior to registering the mortgage and then allow them to close the registration the following day. So there's, there's all sorts of cool stuff you can do. Um, but yeah, that's, that's probably a sample of, of the few most crazy ones I've seen in the last year or so. Can you explain a little bit of the last one, the deferred? So um, this is like, again, super case by case. But so sometimes people say like, uh, like a vendor take back is a good example just to, to use, right? People like this idea of BTBs. Generally, they work horribly because the issue is, if the bank's going to lend you 80%, they want you to put in the 20%. They don't want another loan behind them giving you the 20%. So what happens on a purchase, let's say you could get a bank to give you 80%. And then let's say you have another lender to give you the 20%. Well, typically what would have to happen is for you to close on that purchase, the lawyer needs all the money for the whole purchase, right? So typically both lenders would have to register to accomplish that. Now, in this particular case, we managed to structure a deal with the private where the A lender advanced their 80% and, and we weren't representing the client with the 80%, they were just doing this at their bank, but we got the private to advance the funds on the day of closing so that they could close, but actually defer the mortgage registration a day later so that it didn't have to be registered at the same time as the A lender. And they were actually able to complete the process, fund with the lender, have all the funds released for the deal. And then the private came and registered the second day. Um, it was a bit of a unique situation, but it, we made yeah, it. That's very interesting. And actually that kind of leads into maybe, I guess, because um, one of the people asked um, that, I guess in the smaller ones, if they feel like it's, 
not very easy to actually use creative financing. Um, and, and this was a question from in the morning. So I just feel like sure. you probably need more context, which I can't really give, which is sad because it's a, uh, they've been, I know that they do like flips and burrs, but small ones, um, like uh, probably like either single family homes or duplexes, triplexes. I don't know if that helps. Like I know that that's usually where they're working in. And they were saying that they've tried to use creative financing and um, they weren't able to get things done. And I mean, I think that the deferred thing probably also. Um, yeah, maybe- I mean, there's there's a lot of things. Like, I mean, there's there's just so much that goes into different styles of financing. You really have to have a really in-depth sense of every how everything works. Because once you really understand how everything works, both from like a financing aspect and approval aspect, the legal aspect, you can start like putting things together, right? So you can start mixing and matching and stacking things that you know are not going to interfere with each other. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think it's that's a really critical component is having that really broad knowledge of how everybody is doing their job to be able to then figure out methodologies that are going to allow you to structure the right approach and I think you know as a really broad statement I think that's really what we can bring to the table on the broker side is helping people understand you know how can they stack these things how can they do the right types of financing in the right ways with the right type of lenders to achieve the outcomes that they're trying to achieve you know within the guidelines and and within the the approval regulations that each lender is willing to provide. Yeah, I agree with you. And it's, I think, it, and something you, you notice, it's, it is really important to have like the right kind of people on the team that know, because I feel like there's so many different strategies out there. I'm sure even in like that, even in the mortgage side, there's so many different types of things and, um, you know, not everyone knows everything I feel. So yeah. Uh, Someone like that, like you're saying, like you were able to get one thing done, someone else couldn't. It's probably just because they've never. I'm going to mute that. (laughs) Yeah, and and I think that's it, right? It's understanding lenders. The other thing about private lending, and and I'll say this kind of broadly, is like the banks, you know, there's kind of a, a fixed set of banks, right? Same thing with the B lenders. You know, you know, there's a dozen or so A lenders, a couple dozen B lenders. But I think really where, you know, people uh, maybe don't completely understand this is when, when brokers are doing A and B deals, there's no true brokering in the sense of like kind of old school brokering. Like every mortgage broker really should pretty much have access to the same pool of A and B lenders. There's very few lenders that work exclusively, or maybe some people don't have the minimum thresholds to to be on certain lender lists. But like for the most part, everybody has access to the same products, right? As brokers in the A space and the B space. And I think where it starts to get really um, beneficial for the clients is, is the private space and understanding that there's so many private lenders out there, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. And so, you know, depending on who you're working with, and depending on what their relationships are like with their investor capital and their private lenders is going to determine what kind of offerings they can provide you in the private space. So, you know, if somebody tells me that, hey, somebody tried to do this at Scotiabank and they couldn't get it done, well, there's one or two outcomes. Either it didn't actually work at Scotiabank or the person didn't know what they're doing. But if we pretend everybody's knowing what they're doing, you know, the outcomes of these kind of major lenders should be pretty much the same. But having those private connections, having those kind of private lenders that you can say, hey, you know, will you guys accept a deferred registration on this? And having that relationship to have the private lender say yes, um, you know, that's an important piece of, you know, I'll call it true brokering, where it's truly about having those relationships and bringing that investor need and that borrowing need together into something that's going to be a fit for, for both parties. I agree with you. Relationship is very, very important. Uh, um, and a- anywhere, like building those relationships, because it's very true. Because uh, I know I've gotten things done at the bank. And it's just because that person knows, like, we he's helped me with a lot of, like, specifically with the corporations and stuff, like setting up accounts and things like that. And, and they would tell me, like, 
don't tell anyone I do this. I'm doing it with you because I know you well, you know, and it's just like they know they know like what I do and everything I do. Whereas to live with someone they're meeting for the first time, they would never do that, right? Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Yeah, great point. Um, uh, Yeah, and I think I just want to, and I want to actually go back to um, the corporation, how you're talking about them moving over, because I feel like we glossed over it. I think that's a very... Uh, interesting also concept that you brought that is um, where they had their portfolio of houses and they move it into the corporation and then they were basically starting from zero uh, with houses as uh, right that's what you were saying like now yeah kind of so a lot of them were already in the corp and most of the banks treat that the same as owning them personally the biggest thing was we moved the lender from being residential mortgages in a holding company name to a commercial mortgage across all the properties, right? Oh, and so that's they didn't what allowed need us to, be to in do a the reset. They I were, know. they were in that case. Most of them were. You can do commercial mortgages in personal name as well. They don't actually need to be in a court. But um, it was it was a portfolio lending strategy and with a commercial blanket. And I think that's what allowed us to kind of do the clean sweep. And I'll, again, I, I I did a presentation on this a couple months ago with. Um, with a podcast and I think one of the things that I didn't highlight sufficiently enough is that approval is based on cash flow and I think you know most of the people that talk to me about that and this is why I say a lot of these strategies are very niche strategies is like to have the ability to have a portfolio that cash flows at a 25-year amortization and 75% loan to value at commercial underwriting guidelines I'm going to say is few and far between Right. So unless you're an investor that's heavily dedicated towards cash flow, there's a really good chance that, you know, most of the people that are listening or, or may listen to this call, their portfolio would not come anywhere close to being able to be leveraged at 75% loan to value in a commercial lending scenario. Right. If you're holding single families and duplexes, forget about it, not a chance. Maybe tries and fourplexes, but probably in like secondary, tertiary markets, Windsor, Sarnia, Chatham. You know, prices that meet that coveted 1% rule are when you start having even a shot, right? Um, So I think it's really important to understand that like some of these products, and and this is why I don't always love talking about these because a lot of these products are like, I get to use them, you know, one out of every 50 scenarios, but I have 50 products like that. So as I go through those 50 investors, like I have something for all of them. It's just not the same thing for any of them. Completely agree. Yeah. And I mean, that's why they're creative, right? Yeah. <laughs> they're very <laughs> niche scenarios, because as you said, it is true, especially with COVID and the prices going crazy high. Exactly what you're saying, right? It's um, probably almost nearly impossible to refinance everything right now and still cash flow, especially yeah. if you're saying like single single or duplexes, even triplexes are doing what, like yeah. these right now, you know, they're yeah. like hovering, starting to hover. So it's true. But I think uh, but I think that the point I want to get across with creative financing also, too, is just to kind of open our minds to the possibilities, because I feel like once you start kind of seeing those like, yeah, like there's a lot of things that need to be considered and like that they should be talking to someone like you that has the experience and and does more than the regular broker. Right. Like you'll actually like go through the planning process and it's not about just like, OK, right now I can get it for you and like thinking about, okay, but if we're going to go for a refi, let's make sure it happens there too. Yeah. Um, it's just like, all these things are important, but it's like that opening up the mind to those possibilities. Cause sometimes like that, like someone else may bring up, think of something that just cause of these kind of scenarios that pop up and be like, Oh, what about this? And at least let's try it out. Does it work? I said, maybe not the scenario because it doesn't work, but now it may stick in your head. Like, okay, maybe in some kind of future, it may still be possible. Uh, to do it or or now you know what your conditions have to be and then you maybe even work towards those conditions yeah and there's been lots of times that i've refocused investors on different types of properties different geographic areas and saying like look here's here's what you can buy if what you're buying meets these parameters and now you have to go find an area that you like where properties are available within these parameters um and i think you know that's the type of stuff that it's like you know, when we do what we do, it's not a yes or no. It's not like a yes, I can approve you or no, I can't. It's like, well, have you thought about this? Well, have you thought about that? I mean, we like I and actually a lot of the people on my team do quite a bit of investment, but you know, we hold 
triplexes and fourplexes and apartment buildings and all sorts of different stuff. So, you know, I'm very in tune to understanding the different types of strategies out there. And when I see an investor, when I look at their personal situation, I can help them identify what box they fit in best, right? And it's not that sometimes we can't fit a square peg in a round hole, but generally speaking, you know, if you gravitate towards taking on the investment strategies where you are what the lenders are looking for, you're going to have a much easier time growing and scaling than trying to jam yourself into something that you're always going to feel like you're fighting an uphill battle, right? Um, I came across an investor the other day, very low personal income in comparison to what they want. I think they only made $60,000 a year, but they had about $3 million of cash capital. And it's like, I want to buy a duplex. I'm like, well, that's probably not a good strategy because we're going to run out of runway from a lending perspective real quick. Why don't we look at multifamily? Because they're not going to look at your income. They really only care about experience and capital, which you have plenty of both. And they don't care about your personal debt servicing, right? So saying, you know, scratch the duplex idea. Let's go for 10 plexes. It's like, you're going to get traction because now you're lending and buying the right types of assets where the lenders look at your profile and say, this is my kind of client, right? Um, and, and helping reposition in that way, I think, you know, helps people from fighting those uphill battles. Actually, now that you talk about multi-units, um, I'm just curious on, because again, like at least in Ontario, even multi-units are crazy expensive and you don't really see them cash flowing um, very well. Like what kind of creative um, things do you see in that area or what, what are people doing to be able to, um, you know, get multi-units to, yeah. or to be able to, you know, make sure, for example, you can get it with commercial mortgages. Because obviously once you get to that area, it's all about the cash on like the business sense, right? Like your yeah. business needs to make money, right? And if it's not, yeah. then you're not getting the mortgages, no whatever you need. So I think multis, the, the couple things I'll say on multis is, first of all, you have to understand the stages of the project, right? You have to understand the difference between conventional lending, CMHC lending, project lending. There are lots of lenders out there who will lend high LTVs on properties that don't debt service if we can show them an as is as complete understanding, right? So these are project lenders because the reason most of the multis don't cash flow isn't because they don't cash flow. It's because they're underperforming. It's because we have a building full of people that are paying $700 or the market rents for those units on an improved basis is $1,600 or $1,800, right? And so, you know, there's kind of this, this, specialty we, we have inside of our commercial team, which is like multifamily rehabilitation. So it's people buying underperforming buildings with the intent to rehabilitate, improve the units, take these like old dilapidated things that haven't been touched in 40 years and where the rents are just really low and the living conditions are even worse and rehabilitate these buildings, right? Which does two things. So, you know, number one, you're hopefully adding units and you're, you're creating good livable space, but at the same time from the investment side, you're you know, generating the cash flow that you need. We have lots of project lenders who will lend 80, 85, even percent LTV on non-debt servicing multis on the basis of its ability to be improved and having a plan on, I'm going to buy it for this. It's going to cost me this to renovate. Here's the pro forma at the exit. Here's the appraisal showing what this will be worth when it's done, right? And these lenders in this project space, they're going to come with you for the ride. Like that is a whole segment of lending. And I unfortunately see a lot of brokers who don't understand the commercial space properly and are trying to do commercial deals. What they end up doing is they go private for acquisition and then they take their clients to CMHC on the outset because there's some really, um, what's the best way to put this? Friendly broker lender partners where even you know non-commercial agents can get walked through a CMHC takeout. And so they're putting their clients in products that don't really make sense because they don't truly understand what they're doing in that space. And they haven't built the lender relationships for, again, that very niche type of lending. Um, but that's typically what we're seeing. And the other big thing that I think a lot of people are missing is the ability to add units, the ability to intensify. You talk, you look at any city's plan right now in the city planning and every major city in Southern Ontario has an intensification mandate. It's how can we get more units into more square footage? So um i just 
firmed up on a building in, in Windsor, right? My average square foot per unit is a thousand. That's huge in a multifamily, right? Our expectation is that by reconfiguring the units, we can increase our total units on that building by about 50%, right? And we can bring that average square footage down to around 650, 700, have still a good unit mix, add more units, which is what the city wants, um, and be able to, to create something that generates way more cash flow because a thousand square foot unit does not rent for double what a 500 square foot unit rents for, right? Um, so it's not a linear equation there. So if you can make better use of the space, commercial to residential conversion, right? There's lots of these cities where there's, you know, second floor commercial office space or even first floor commercial space at the back where, you know, with some, some small permit applications and, and maybe minor variances, you can repurpose that commercial space into more residential units. And it's very unlikely that if you're doing it in a smart way and in a way that abides by the city bylaws, you're going to get a lot of pushback on that stuff. Because again, this is what the cities want. They need supply. They need you know, mid-range rental housing. Um, there are certain programs right now through CMHC that were launched just two months ago that, you know, allow CMHC to do loan-to-values up to 95% and amortizations up to 50 years through their MLI Select program. Again, understanding that that's not available for all deals, it's not available to everybody. There's like a specific niche that there has to be aspects of your deal that can fit. And there's plenty of deals that we can help coach people how to rework your project and your plan to make it fit that program so that you can reap the benefits. Um, there's so much opportunity in the multi-space if you know how to do it right and you know how to properly lend on it. And I guess also, uh, um, you know, get it for the right price too. Because <laughs> even yeah. like I, I've seen some that uh, they're fully done and renovated, but they wouldn't cash flow. So I think that was more just probably than the pricing is, for that specific yeah. and, and understanding as well and i think this is getting a little rampant in i'm going to call it the active investor community it's the investor community that goes out and is going to multifamily conferences and is networking and going on facebook groups those investors tend to be higher ltv investors and i say this really broadly because there is some silent old big money that is just happy to have a 50 percent ltv mortgage on that building right they're just going to come in and it's a $4 million purchase price. They're going to put their $2 million down. They're going to get their $2 million from the bank. And that's fine because they have $30 million sitting in an account that needs to be deployed into something more productive than a savings account, right? So those stabilized assets, it's not necessarily always that they're overpriced, but they're being priced for people that aren't looking to leverage the way that a lot of us in, in the more active community are looking to leverage. And so Again, going without working backwards when we're doing multis, the most important thing is the as complete performa. What is this going to be worth when you finish the project? And then what is it going to cost you to take it there? And how long is that going to take? And what do those carry costs look like? And then how much are you buying it for? And are you leaving upside, right? And there's a lot of times where we work backwards through that process to realize that there's no way the deal works, right? There just isn't enough juice in the deal to have, to have it come close to working. And again, if you have seen people get into dangerous positions because they get financing and they buy things and they don't understand that there's no hope of getting it taken out um, based on the as complete performance. So it has to work going backwards. That, that would be the other comment. Yeah, great, great point. Yeah, like you, I feel like exactly what you say. Like, it's funny. There's been some people I tell them like, sorry, I don't have rich people money. Like I need, like, I was like, this is a business to me, you know, yeah. I need to make sure the numbers make sense. And, and it's true because it's either that, like people who have the money and they're just wanting to sit it in an asset or again, people that just don't do their proper due diligence mm -hmm. and end up, although I don't even understand how they end up screwing themselves over because normally a B lender, A lender wouldn't accept it. Cause like that, like it's not running as a business and or they're going to probably get like a really low. Usually, so uh, usually low. the people that I see get messed up is people who are doing a project. It's not stabilized improved purchases. It's people doing a project and they're coming in with private financing, right? So we're coming in out of the gate with high LTV private money at a high rate. And we're getting into this project because we acquired it for what we thought was a good price, right? But when you play it out in terms of the cost to improve it, what it's going to look as a stabilized asset, the lending that that fully improved 
product support is not enough to pay back the debt that we've taken on to do the product project. Um, that's where I see people get into trouble because now they're halfway through, right? And now the closer and closer they get, if nobody spent the time to show them that final product and show them how much funding that final product would support, it's a very dangerous position. The other thing that I'll say is a dangerous position is the interest rate environment, right? Going back to debt servicing, and sorry, because I'm kind of getting off course here, but a year ago or a year and a half ago, like I've issued CMHC mortgages under 2%. Right on 40 year amortizations on commercial buildings. Those rates are now above four. So, you know, if we were in those days where it was 2% and somebody was looking at a project, and let's say we were being generous and let's say we were doing all the things we should be doing, we were starting with the end in mind, we were understanding what kind of lending it support. Let's say that project supported a loan of 3.2 million on the exit, right? Well, now it's a year, year and a half later, they're done the project. So the project's over, right? And now we're going to the refinance. Well, now those CMHC rates are 4%. Well, what does that mean? It means the payments are higher. Well, what does that mean? The debt servicing doesn't work as well. That loan differential was a 30% cutback. That's how the debt servicing chips fell on that. So with the rates going from two and a half to four, it cut our total ability to lend from 3.2 million to 2.5 million. That's 700,000 in capital less back, which is 30% of the total expected capital. Again, it's not that anybody did anything wrong, but I'm seeing a lot of people that are being very squeezed right now because there were projections that were being made in a different environment, right? And we're not there anymore. And I don't think we'll be there for quite some time. And now we're trying to figure out how to recuperate from that. And the higher percent LTV and the, the less amount of confidence you have, that's, that's if we were doing everything right from the get-go, right? And then for those that weren't, and maybe from the get-go, it, it probably wasn't going to work anyways. And now we have these elevated lending rates. You know, this is where we can see people get deep, right? And, and they get quite, you know, in, into trouble in terms of their ability to take out that debt. Completely agree, yes. Or even things like, um, noticing that going into smaller city like towns or like villages, people don't realize that, you know, for example, like some lenders don't like it and they won't lend there. So like you said, they'll go private just to quickly close. Don't do their due diligence. They're trying to refinance back with like an A lender or something. And then they realize they can't or they're not getting the terms they expended because they're looking at only one A lender that doesn't even lend in that area anyways. <laughs> yeah, so I think it's great that you're bringing up all these points because, um, yeah, I feel like you see so many things happening. And sometimes I, I don't know, I feel sometimes like I'm crazy. Like I was like, what are you guys looking at over there? You know, <laughs> like yeah. what is going on? Because uh, um, yeah, I was like, I don't know if I just have a very conservative mentality and I like do wait. I just sometimes think like, do I do way too much diligence? Because sometimes you see do people doing things and I'm like, tell me how it goes because I don't see it working out, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so I yeah, think it's absolutely. great points that you make. Um, yeah, thank you so much for coming on. It was really awesome to hear all, everything you had to say. I know everyone got a lot of value. Uh, from your from what you've provided and hopefully it also sets some realities for people because especially yeah sorry I'll let Colbert Colbert say something sorry I always screw up your oh, name. Me, sorry um I wanted to ask um he talked about um, doing a portfolio like um conversion to a a business kind of thing mm -hmm. I wanted yeah. to know when is that possible? When do you guys do that? Is there a certain number, like, or do you look you, for an LTV? Usually never, because the cash flow doesn't support it. Um, okay. What I would say is really key for that for most people is like low loan to value, good cash flow, but low income clients, right? So, like, I have eight properties my average loan to value across the portfolio is 40% or 50%. So I don't owe a lot because a lot, maybe a lot of it's from 2015 or 16. We've just, the cash flow made sense on those properties at the time, but it doesn't in a refinance state now. 
maybe they're only showing 50 or 60,000 of income on paper. So qualifying for a bank mortgage is, is hopeless because they have you know four or 5 million of debt across the properties. You know, something like that is a good candidate for portfolio lending. If you're already at 70, 75%, 80%, no chance, it, it won't work. And if, if you're not having really strong cash flow through the portfolio, it's probably not going to work. So it, it's, there isn't like a graduated system, right? I think, you know, the, the best way to describe it is like, not every investor is going to follow the same road. Everybody's situation is going to be completely unique. What I advise to three different people in roughly the same portfolio situation is likely going to be completely different. Um, and it's all based on your properties, your strategy, you know, where you are in your life cycle and your employment, what it is you want to do next. Um, yeah, so it's, it's not really an easy answer. There's no kind of trigger point to say like, when you hit here, do this, right? It's, it's more of a big picture plan and a big picture vision for where you're at, where you're going, how can we optimize to get there? Okay, sounds good. Thank you so much. No problem. Okay, we're getting to the hour, eight o'clock. <laughs> Thank you so much, David. Like I was saying before, the information you provide was amazing. And also just like that, the kind of sharing that, you know, setting things to reality and kind of making sure you really do your due diligence and, and um, you know, checking like that, like you said, start from the end, like what is the end goal to the property and then going from the beginning and, um, and I mean, they just need to use you. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Awesome. Well, thanks we'll take so much care of all of that for, for them. <laughs> <laughs> thanks so much for putting this together, Diana. I really appreciate it. Thanks for everybody who joined and, and everybody who had questions. Um, always happy to go through and do, you know, a bit of an individual discussion and consultation for, for anybody that, that has questions. I mean, like I said, a lot of this is niche product. And, you know, what that means is I really have to understand what you have, what you're doing. And then, you know, from there, I can kind of point you in the direction that's going to fit your strategy and your growth path and, and your situation. Um, and that's the one tough thing about these types of presentations and this types of types of lending. Like it, it really isn't a one size fits all situation. But it's Sorry, more guys. about like what you're saying, the planning, right? To plan it. it. Is. And then you can find out you like you'll say these are the criteria to get to that and you know, it's like you need to yeah. know your end goal to get to. Well, and everybody has a different strategy, right? Everybody's going after different stuff. It, it's all about kind of creating the vision and creating the plan and then, you know, amalgamating a, a lending strategy into it. I just realized I didn't put contact info up for, yeah. for some people. And do you want to just verbally say it? Because people in the group will also probably want to know in the Facebook group. So if you want to yeah. also verbally tell people. It's uh, david at visionmortgagegroup.ca. Um, I don't know, Dan, if you can have a way to cascade, cascade that through, uh, through Facebook. Yeah, I'll, I'll copy paste it in the comments for them so that they can also get it from the comments. Um, okay, so that's the best way for them to contact you? Yeah, yeah, just shoot me an email and uh, one of my team will, will reach out and set up a time for, uh, for us to have a chat and I can kind of go through a little bit of what, you know, what your situation is and where I'd recommend each person go. Do you want to um, answer one more question? <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know if I completely understand it. Um, you want to jump on audio and elaborate on that one a little bit? Mauricio, do you want to go on uh, on mic and just explain what your question is? Uh, yes, Dave, uh, in, your, in your experience, what are the, the most uh, difficult decision making issues involved in, 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 in investing, in the financing and investing? Um, that's kind of a broad question. I mean, I, I really think it comes down to, I, I guess, maybe I'll give you a little bit of a, a twist on that. I, I, the difficult ones, it, it all depends on the deal. The most important one is actually having a strategy, like really having a very particular investment strategy that you understand how to separate deals that you're going to buy from deals that you're not going to buy um, and being able to set a clear path based on that strategy and, and have a formula that's going to basically give you a yay or nay answer on stuff, right? I, I think it, it's, it is difficult because it's really understand 
you're getting so much information, you're getting blasted from, from every real estate investment, you know, coach and presenter and, and everything of all these different strategies in these areas and whatever. And it's very hard to pinpoint what it is that you want to do. But what I say to my investors is like, pick a niche and be really good at it. People who are just kind of scattered all over the place tend to be the ones that are the least successful. So find, you know, one really good strategy that works for you and, and push forward. Thank you. Awesome. Well, thanks so much, everyone. Thanks, Diana. And uh, Thank you, yeah, Thank you, everybody Diana. enjoy the rest of your night. Thank you, everyone. We'll see everyone in the next episode. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.